Good morning, everyone. We're going to wait one more minute and we're going to start right now this lecture. I see that some of you uh, were on the previous presentation about Angel Aligner. So I'm happy that you're going to spend uh, the whole morning with us. Okay, ready? If there is any problem with the presentation, with the slides or with the videos, just please uh, write on the chat and, and let me know. So good morning again, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to, to explain you how uh, the SAS method works. You know that the SAS method is a new product that we have launched. It's an online training program of 12 months. And I'm going to explain all the details about this method. And together with this, we're going to review a special case, a very interesting case that I guess that you have seen on the on the pictures uh, published on, on Instagram and on the emails. Well, let's begin with the patient and start analyzing the, the external pictures, the smile of the patient. We can see that the patient has uh, some type of occlusal gant. So this could be related with the growth of the patient and also related with the function of the patient. You know that if we don't work symmetrically, the body is going to develop in a different shape. It's like a tennis player. If you have a, a left a tennis player that, um, okay, one second. Yeah. Uh, that arm is going to be bigger than the, the right one. So this is going to be very similar in the, in the mouth. If you work more uh, on the right side or on the left side, that side is going to grow in a different way and also the upper arch, the upper bone, is going to develop asymmetrically. Looking at the internal pictures, what we can detect here? Some crowding, some open bite tendency. The screen is blocked. Okay, one second. Because <laughs> I think that Now you can see it, yes. And if I click here, the, do you see the arrow? Yes, great, thank you. Okay, continue analyzing this internal picture. We can see that there is some open by tendency. Maybe there is a tongue thrust habit. And we also have a very um, narrow maxillary and a bone. So um, the patient has an unilateral cross bite together with crowding. When we see this type of cross bite, we must check the centrioral relation of the patient because this maximum intercuspension could not be the ideal uh, occlusion for the patient. Those are the lateral pictures. You can see that the patient has class two and a symmetric class two related <clears throat> or together with the cross bite and checking the x-rays. We don't see any seal, anything special. We don't have upper eights, so we can distalize upper arts with no extractions. And on the lateral x-ray, you can see the skeletal class two of the patient. This augmented overbite is also related with the skeletal discrepancy. Well, now let's think how we want to plan this case or how we want to solve this case. If we just check those pictures, we will say, okay, I want to expand the upper arch 
more the right side than the left side and distalize both arches, right? To solve the class two problem. We don't want to proclaim too much lower incisors because here they are uh, well positioned respected to the lower jaw. So we just want to distalize the upper teeth. But when we check the central elevation, we detect this functional deviation. This functional deviation is more than three millimeters deviation. When we have uh, more than two millimeters, a study said that the, the risk of having some uh, TNJ problems is higher than in a normal patient. When the maximum index patient and the central relation are similar or, or maybe just with one or two millimeters of deviation, in those cases, the patient uh, can adapt to that situation. But with more than two millimeters, there is a risk of creating TNJ problems when the patient gets older. This patient uh, is very young, so this is why maybe uh, she doesn't have any problems right now. But in the future, if we maintain this type of occlusion, it could be dangerous for her. So there is a medical reason to treat this patient. It's not just an aesthetic reason. Here, uh, she wants to improve lower alignment and close the, the bite. But I explained to her that we also need to improve this aspect in order to uh, reduce the risk of TNJ problems in the future and achieve a more stable occlusion. This type of deviation should be considered when we are planning the case. When we plan the case in the position of the uh, left picture, it's completely different as if we plan the case as in the right picture, because that deviation is the final position of the lower jaw that you want. But there is another consideration here. When we um, place both arches in that position on the virtual planning, we must take into account that there is an interference that is increasing the vertical dimension of the patient. Okay, and all these type of knowledge or explanations or plannings are going to be explained in the 12 month training program of the SAS method online course. This training program is divided in different models. We're going to, to see more of them uh, during every month. Each month you will have access to two or three uh, models. And we start with some basic content about case selection, you know, communication to the technician, how to uh, plan the cases, how to write, write instructions, 3D modifications, basics about attachments, IPR, how to analyze the CVCT, modify attachments, this type of, of plannings, plannings in central relation. Then we go to the model number two in where we are going to, to explain uh, all the movement breakability with aligners, the sequences needed to improve this breakability and many clinical conditions like crowding, diastemas, deep bite, open bite, cruise bite, how to use elastics with aligners, how to apply the protocols to each patient and also how to manage impacted canines and do occlusal adjustments. And in the last model, in the model number three, we're going to go uh, more in depth with a advanced context about axillary techniques, periodontal patients, orthodontic combined with prosthetic treatments. Also, how to manage uh, growing patients, mandibular advancement, and all that stuff. And also, with this 12 month training program, you will have access to more than 50 hours of clear aligner content to complement this training program. Continue with the planning. I want to analyze from different views the first plan that the technician sent to us and the plan that I have approved. I want to show you how I do the how I did the, the modifications on this patient because we all face the same problems. We are going to receive the first plan, but we must check this plan and detect all the mistakes of the plan and modify them in order to get a good treatment planning. So this is how <clears throat> we are going to, to analyze this first case. First plan, we see the stylization of the second quadrant on the fourth quadrant. Then after the distalization is done, we see anterior movements. And we also see that 
they are placing power ridges at the beginning and extrusion attachments later on upper incisors. There are also uh, buttons placed on the upper canines and lower molars. Those buttons uh, were asked by us. And then on the next plan, the one that is approved, there are some differences compared to the first one. And here is, now is your turn. Now you must think about which differences uh, do you detect between those plannings. I will help you. First of all, I removed power ridges. Why? Because the risk of uh, tracking problems is higher with those power ridges. If we are moving upper incisors and we are extruding them at the same time, it's better to place attachments from the beginning because attachments are retentive, power ridges are not. That's why this is the main modification that we can check from this frontal view. Then the other mistake related with power ridges is that they didn't place any extrusion attachments for uh, extrude upper incisors. And also from this view, if we remember the smile of the patient, also on this first planning, they were extruding too much lower incisors and canines. That could affect the, the smile aesthetics of the patient because we don't want to increase a lower incisor display. We want to, to level both arches, but with no uh, not too much extrusion of lower teeth. So here on the last planning that, the, that we have approved, we can see this uh, extrusion reduced compared to the first one. From this lateral view, that one is the most important. What can we see on this first planning? Upper reclination and lower sequential distalization to create a space to align lower teeth. Right? They are distalizing 47, 46, and thanks to the distalization, they create enough space to align premolars and to uh, solve crowding without an excessive proclination of lower incisors. This uh, was one of the goals of the, of the case. But there are more mistakes here. Let's go with the final planning. What can we see on this final planning? We are not extruding everything. We are leveling both arches instead of trying to get contact on every tooth by upper and lower extrusion. And then after this leveling, we ask for a virtual jump. Why? Because if we understand um, this first planning, the way that both arches uh, are contacting, they are contacting just in some points that those points are interferences. And that is not the real vertical dimension of the patient. The real vertical dimension of the patient is less than this one. So this open bite that we have created, um, placing the case in central relation is not real. That is why we must level both arches instead of trying to occlude both arches. They are different concepts. You see that here, they are not intruding molars. But my idea is to intrude molars because thanks to that intrusion, we are going to reduce or eliminate the interferences and the same time, we are going to solve part of the class two problem. Also, we know that posterior intrusion is not predictable. That is why I am finishing with some open bite between sevens and between sixes, more in sevens than sixes. Because I know that this amount of intrusion is not going to be completely achieved. And also, I eliminate the distalization of the lower arch because we are using class two elastics. If you use class two elastics and you distalize the lower arch, you can create a problem on the lower arch because the same problem that we can see on the upper arch when we distalize, but those spaces start opening to mesial because of uh, prematurities of a uh, lack of anchorage on the lower arch. If we use class two elastics, the aligner is going to push molars back, but with the elastics, the real effect is going to be mesialization of the lower arch. 
So we are going to procline excessively the lower incisors. And that was uh, one of the things that we don't want to do. So we must reduce or eliminate this lower distalization, assuming that we don't need to distalize the lower arch. We are treating a class two case. So we just need to distalize the upper arch, but not the lower arch. From the other side, we can detect also more mistakes. From the first plan, sorry, that was from the first plan to the approved plan, we can see that the distalization patterns are different. Here we have every tooth moving at different times, but on the first plan, you can see from this moment, look at here, you can see how every tooth is moving at the same time, all anterior teeth are moving at the same time, and also four and three start the stylization at the same time. When five achieves around 50% of the stylization, they start to move all anterior teeth and the four. Well, for this amount of stylization, it's better to increase the sequence because when we are going to stylize more than two millimeters, we need more anchorage. And here we are just using elastics. We need also posterior anchorage to assist this anterior distalization. The more we distalize, the more anchorage uh, we need. And that is why here you can see the final sequence in where we start with five, then four, then continue with three when five is finished. And this separate sequence is going to increase the total number of aligners. Here on this first planning, uh, we had 65 aligners. It's a lot of time, but it's a complex case. And also, I assume that part of this visualization is not going to be done because it's very difficult to complete this amount of millimeters of distalization. But it's not a problem for me because I know that part of the class two is going to be solved just with the counterclockwise rotation of the lower jaw when we have solved when we solve the prematurities. This is the main change from this view. And let's go to the occlusal views. Here we can see something similar. Look at here, how the distalization is done, and here the same. There are some differences between this type of retrusion or distalization and between this type of distalization. And also, we have added on this approved plan buttons on palatal side. Why? Because we want to expand the upper arch. Remember that we have a very narrow marcillary arch. We need to solve the cross bite or the edge to edge relation when we place the, the case in centric relation. We need to solve this discrepancy. And it's better to place elastics to assist upper expansion because when we just uh, trust on aligners to solve a cross bite, sometimes we can get stuck. So please place buttons in cases with cross bite functional or skeletal cross bite, no matter. It's better to use elastics 24 hours or 12 hours, depending on the on the situation, together with the liners. And in that way, we can start with expansion of the first quadrant at the beginning. We don't need to use the first quadrant as anchorage to distalize the second quadrant or to expand the second quadrant. We can do everything simultaneously because we are increasing the anchorage here. We are using elastics uh, 24 hours class two um, cross bite elastics from the beginning on the right side, and also on the left side we combine a uh, cross bite with class two elastics. On the lower arts, what you can see here is the distalization plan on the first quadrant that we have dilated on the on the approved plan, and there are no more mistakes. But on the approved plan we have taken into account that the lower rotations could be difficult. And because of that, I asked to place buttons on this point. When the rotations are finished, I asked for buttons on those premolars. And this is because in case that I uh, don't see this rotation done, I'm going to use auxiliary techniques to rotate this premolar.
I'll show you later, okay? So that is also a minor mistake. This I cannot consider this a mistake to don't have those buttons, but it's interesting to understand the limits or the problems that uh, you may have during an aligner phase. And also uh, place these buttons or place any other things to um, avoid uh, the necessity to cut every aligner <clears throat> because with those buttons, I don't need to cut anything. I just place the mini tubes and the patient can continue with the same aligners. It's less work. And this type of case analysis is what we do on the weekly case review sessions. This is the, the most important part and, and the most differential part of the SAS method. We are going to uh, review all your cases together with other doctors in a small groups of five, seven doctors. And in this uh, weekly case review sessions, we analyze your cases and also we can analyze the past treatments. We must check uh, our mistakes to improve um, the, our plannings. And this is something that we can do every week and during 12 months, you're going to improve a lot with this type of revisions because you are going to learn clear aligners with your own cases, not just study uh, books, articles, protocols, that is the, the principles of orthodontics are very important, but also we want you to understand how to apply them to your own patients. And this is what we're going to do on this uh, weekly case review sessions. Continue with the progress of the case. Here we can see that at the aligner 25, the rotations were not completely done. And we start with those buttons on premolars. <clears throat> we place buttons on lower premolars because we want to combine class two, class two elastics with open bite elastics. We want to start anterior extrusion. But as you can see, the posterior cross bite is solved. Now we don't have any type of deviation. The patient the lower jaw of the patient is centered and she uh, felt that. She told me uh, on this stage that she didn't feel any movement, any strange movement of the lower jaw. She felt more stability from that moment. Continue with the progress. We place the sectional wires, the mini tubes. And if you remember the precision cuts that we have asked on the planning, you can see how they can fit perfectly with those uh, mini tubes. The mini tubes are smaller than braces. So this is uh, one of the main advantages of them that you don't need to cut or to do extra cuts on the on the aligners. And that is going to, to be a less work for you on, on every checkup. So here, continue with the uh, rotation and extrusion of, of premolars, the bite closure, the anterior bite closure. The transverse problem is per perfectly solved and class one is almost achieved. So the progress of the case is really good. We have 65 aligners, so it's better to take care of every detail on this first and longest stage to go to a refinement with less aligners. Those are the elastics that we have used here because with those elastics, we help to extrude upper incisors and we also help to extrude and level lower premolars. When you place sectional wires, it's better to combine them with elastics because if you don't place elastics, it's easy to see how one of the uh, tooth of the final part, for example, the canine or the premolar, starts to intrude. Always place vertical force to avoid those undesired effects on those uh, tooth. And this is the first refinement. We continue leveling lower premolars and solve the class two with more distalization. We distalize, now we are distalizing everything together because we're going to place class two elastics 24 hours a day. And there was a very uh, low amount of distalization of the upper arch, just one millimeter. And here they are placing power ridges, but now it's not a problem. At the beginning, that was a problem because I want to do more pure extrusion, not just relative extrusion. But here I am retruding 
upper incisors. And with that retrusion, I'm going to extrude them a bit around one millimeter. And this is the extrusion that you can see on this clean check. So here is not a problem to have those power ridges. And also when you place those power ridges, you can control in a better way the retrusion of them and control the torque of the of the inside <coughs> of the incisors when you retrude them. This is the, the evolution. And then we continue with the sectional wires writing the, the um, premolars, so the rotations. And one of the uh, good aspects about auxiliary techniques is that they are going to increase the, the breakability of the aligner treatment. We know that some movements are difficult when we have uh, short crowns, when we have difficult movements, for example, extrusion movement combined with rotation, with teeth movements. These type of movements are very hard to do with plastic. As uh, they were talking in the in the previous session, uh, Maria and Johnny about angel aligner, they explained the differences between Asian and Caucasian patients. And Asian patients are perfect for aligners because they have very big crowns, but Caucasian patients, maybe not, they are not uh, with the same characteristics. And some of them have very short crowns. With short crowns is less plastic and also less retention. And that is why uh, those auxiliary techniques are very helpful in that type of cases. Okay, and these uh, auxiliary techniques are also explained on the on the SAS method online course. We have different uh, hands-on online courses about stripping, about occlusal adjustment, uh, about um, mini screw basement. Sorry that the videos are in the in the opposite way. The IPR is on, is the first one, and the occlusal adjustment is on the second place. So. This type of uh, online hands-on courses are going to uh, help you to start do all these things um, safely in your patients. First of all, it's better to practice in these materials. We are going to send with the online hands-on courses all this material, typodont, anatomic model, or the all the bars needed, uh, mini screws, the driver, all the stuff needed to practice before applying those techniques to your patients. So once you have learned those uh, techniques on those typodons and anatomy models, you can start doing them on your patients with no problem and no risk. And these hands-on courses are just included on the VIP option of the SAS method. And for today, we are going to, to make uh, this special offer for the first five, and we are going to uh, reduce the, the price of the SAS method to 1,000 uh, euros with this code. And you will have access to the VIP program with all the uh, lessons of the 12 month training program, the uh, hands-on courses, all the related content with aligners, the weekly sessions, everything with the price of the pro method. So I leave this slide just a few seconds if you want to take the picture. And continue with the case. Let's go now with the <clears throat> second refinement. Now the case is almost finished. We have solved the rotations, the leveling of the lower premolars. That was the, uh, this was the one of the most difficult uh, things in this case. I thought at the beginning that one of the main problems here uh, was going the, um, the functional deviation correction, but that was something very fast. We did just uh, in 25 aligners, we solved that functional deviation. And also the class two was not very difficult to solve. But the lower premolar movements were really were really difficult to, to correct, even with the auxiliary techniques. So now in this second refinement, we just face uh, this situation and the final settlement is our main goal. But on the upper arch, there are some minor details. If you look at the upper teeth, I play it again. What did you see? They are not extruding everything at the same time. You can see the slightly mm -hmm. 
you can see how they are rotating upper canines first and then doing the extrusion. This is one way to improve the breakability. If we want to finish fast, we need to increase the breakability, not reduce the number of aligners. Because if we increase the breakability, we are going to reduce the number of refinements. That's the idea of a clean check. So here we ask for first mesh allowed of 13 and then extrusion. And you can see buttons of on upper canines and on lower canines and premolars. Those buttons are going to be used for assist upper extrusion because with those elastics, it's better to uh, or it's easier to extrude upper teeth and close the anterior open bite. Also, with those elastics, we are going to maintain class two elastics because we are still with some class two on the right side. As you can see here, uh, upper and lower midline are not completely centered. During the extrusion of upper teeth, we also place nighttime elastics from 23 to 43 to ensure that both midlines are centered. The way to solve this midline discrepancy is with the midline nighttime elastics and class two elastics on the right side. On the left side, we place also, or we maintain the button for class two, but we didn't use it because it was not necessary. The class, the class one was uh, perfectly maintained on this face. On this lateral view, you can check how we have this class one on the right, on the left side, some class two on the left that is going to, on the right, that is going to be solved with the class two elastics and the midline elastics. And after this phase, about uh, 11 aligners, this was the result. And this is one of the most complex things to, to do with, <clears throat> with clear aligners, to improve this settlement, to improve the occlusion or to close the, the bite. We have prematurities on posterior teeth, and this is one of the things that we are going to, to explain on the hands-on course of occlusal adjustment, how we do these occlusal adjustments. With braces, it's very common to adjust the case or to do the occlusal adjustment at the end of the case. But with aligners, these occlusal adjustments are going to be done during the whole treatment, sometimes at the beginning, but never just at the end. Because if we wait at, uh, just uh, when we finish uh, with the liner treatment to do the occlusal adjustments, sometimes uh, these type of movements are going to be um, almost impossible to, to achieve with the, with the liner, with the plastic. So here on this phase, together with the planning, I start doing occlusal adjustments from the first stage, from the first aligner of this second refinement. And thanks to those occlusal adjustments on molars, on premolars, on every cusp that uh, has an interference or a prematurity, with those uh, grinds, grindings, we can improve the breakability or we can create space to extrude upper and lower premolars and canines and achieve this settlement. On posterior teeth, on, on molars, we don't have a perfect, perfect occlusion. One of the doctors uh, told us on the Telegram group that this was not the, the best occlusion for a patient. Of course, it's not the best. It's, this is not a 10, maybe it's an eight, a nine on the post, on, on molars, on premolars and canines, the occlusion is uh, really good. But on molars, we still have some space between upper and lower molars. And that is, uh, the doctor was right. The way uh, to improve this occlusion is just continue doing occlusal adjustments, but finishing the treatment and stop using aligners. Because when you don't use aligners, for those teeth, it's easier to increase the contact between them. Maybe it's not just about extrusion. Maybe they need to modify some degrees of, of torque. And those modifications, as uh, with braces, we will uh, do those modifications easier if we just leave them free with no aligners, with no attachments, just with a uh, retention, nighttime retention, you will see after three months, four months, how this settlement is improved. I will take the pictures and I will show you in the future. And this is the initial, the final comparison, the final result. And you see that both midlines are almost in the same place as the beginning, but if you remember how was the functional deviation that we had around three millimeters of discrepancy between upper and lower midline, 
this final result is amazing. So I want to finish explaining you the differences and what is included in both plans of the SAS method. We have the pro plan in where you will have uh, access to the group and individual case review sessions. We are going to do weekly um, group sessions and monthly individual sessions. Also with this, you will have uh, access to the 12 month online program with uh, many, many lessons about aligners and 50 hours of clear aligner content of many speakers of all around the world, of the world, uh, international and national speakers. And also we will plan 10 TPS treatment planning services for you during this period. And we will uh, give you 12 clinical and marketing guides to complement all this training. On the VIP program, you're going to have mainly the same as in the pro plan, but we have more TPS. We have 15 TPS during the whole year instead of 10 TPS. And the most different and important part is that you will have access to the three online hands-on course and you are going to receive all the material needed for this hands-on course. The material that we're going to send for this course, you can also use it later at your practice because they are bars, uh, mini screws, and this is useful for you also out of these courses. And I give you again this special offer. If you didn't have enough time to scan or to take the picture, now you have a second chance to scan the, the code. And during this time that I leave this uh, slide, you can write any questions you have about the SAS method or about the case. On the chat, or if you want, you can connect the, your audio and ask the question. Well, Daniele, hello. He's asking about class to elastics. Okay, See, he's asking about the elastics used in the second refinement. I ask, I, I place here 12 hours elastics, nighttime is, or 12 hours, whatever, uh, on midline and on the, on the right side, both 12 hours not 24 hour elastics. Because when you don't have a space between upper and lower anterior teeth, you cannot use 12, 24 hour elastics. If you use 24 hour elastics and you have contacts between cannons or between incisors, you have uh, two solutions for that. Two occlusal adjustments on um, of, of upper crests, for example, to create a space and to allow the lower mesialization or um, the other option is to reduce the, the time of the elastics because if you continue with 24 hours and you have an anterior contact, you are increasing the risk of creating a posterior open bite. And Daniela is also asking about how to settle posterior occlusion with aligners night time. He's suggesting to use or to wear aligners night time without attachments and with no elastics. Yes, that is also a good way to do it when you have around 0 0.5 or one millimeter of space between upper and, and lower teeth. You remove all attachments to avoid any, any contacts with the aligners or any contacts with the upper teeth because if you have one contact between an attachment on the lower arch and one cusp of the upper arch, that premolar or that molar is not going to, to extrude. So that's a good point. Remove attachments, reduce aligner's time, just night time. And with that, and also the patient function should be uh, symmetric. It's very important to, to remember that to the patient. Uh, you can improve the settlement with no elastics, with nothing special. But this is more or less the same as uh, you can do when you finish the case and just leave the patient with the retainers. Leaving the patient with the retainers is almost the same as leaving with the aligners nighttime, with the last aligners. Simona is asking about the mini tubes. What wire do you use in segmental tubes? 
In this type of magnitudes, my sequence is 0 0.14, then 16, and then 1625, or 1622, and then 1625. With those four wires, it's enough to solve every rotation or extrusion or any deep movement. And all of them are of a uh, night type. I don't use stainless steel on these mini tubes because they are very small. And if you place a stainless steel wire, it's going to be very difficult to introduce the wire inside them. Just in cases of messialization, on those cases, you can use stainless steel, but it's going to be very hard for you to, to introduce them. Theodora is asking, how do you combine class two and cross bite elastics at the same time? Well, the idea of class two cross bite elastics is to use cross bite elastics, but with a sagittal component with class two direction. And the way to do this is to place elastics, for example, from five to six or from five to seven, but from palatal five to buccal seven or to buccal six. Okay. And with this, you are creating this type of force is an inclined force, it's not vertical force, it's not like a normal um, cross bite elastic and when you just create expansion forces, not distalization or mesialization forces. So that is the way to manage this, this type of, of elastics, this type of combined elastics. Hi, sorry for interrupting. Just Anna is yeah. asking about where do I buy mini tubes? Well, I buy them in ProClinic, but, uh, I don't know if it's in, in all the countries, uh, but they are from GH, if I don't remember. Let me let me check. I'm going to tell you the brand. Because those mini tubes are stops of the wires. They are not special. Yes, G and H wire, that is the brand. This is the reference, if you can see the reference there. I guess that the reference, the reference here, this one, is for all the countries is a, of the supplier. So you, you can look at that reference because there are two sizes. I recommend you to buy the the larger one. The larger one is nineteen twenty five, but they are from G and H. I guess that all of you know GNH wire brand. Daniele, did you have palatal cut, cuts on the molars to solve the cross bite? Did you use them while distalizing or first transverse the vertical and final sagittal? No, I do everything at the same time. I solve expand and like I start expansion first during seventh distalization. I place conventional cross bite elastics. When six is a start, I start with cross bite and class two component elastics. And then when the when the expansion is done, when the cross bite is solved and the lower jaw is centered with no functional deviation, at that moment I just focus on class two correction because I don't need to apply any extra expansion forces. Theodore. Hi, what I meant was if your cross bite is on sixes and the cross arch elastics is placed over the button there, where would you please, would you please the class two button? But you can combine both. Even if you have just one button on six, you can place cross bite elastics to the six and also on the same button, place class two elastics. 
Maybe that was the question. Yes. When you use four ounces elastics, it's possible. Okay. <laughs> when you use four ounces, it's possible to place two of them. But if you use six ounces, it's very difficult to find a, a button like that, a button to, to maintain two six ounces elastics. So I recommend you to place composite elastics, a button, sorry, composite buttons instead of metallic buttons if you want to, to use six ounces, two different elastics of six ounces. That's a good tip. But here I start first, when I use both of them, I also um, uh, use four ounces and six ounces. Six ounces for cross bite, then four ounces for class two. And when I stop using cross bite elastics, I continue with six ounces class two elastics. But there is no special protocol for those cases. This is what I am trying to, to explain to you on this, on this lecture, that I manage the case in every appointment. I modify the, the protocol in every appointment here because I don't know how is she going to, to evolve. These type of cases are very strange. You cannot fit to one protocol. You cannot say, well, I'm going to place these elastics and I'm going to maintain those elastics during the whole treatment. It's no possible, it's, there is no way to do it because the patient is going to change the bite. It's going to center the bite. And we don't know how that's, that is going to be. And also after, <laughs> sorry. And also after the, <clears throat> the prematurity correction, the vertical dimension is going to affect the sagittal relation. And that is something that we are going to check on the, on the appointments. And depending on the on the progress, we are going to continue with cross bite or increasing the, the force of the class two elastics, modifying the size of one side or the other, depending on how amount of class two uh, do we have in in the left or on the on the right side. And in that way, step by step, appointment by appointment, you will achieve this bilateral class one with no functional deviation. That's the idea. Any more doubts or suggestions about the case? Well, if there are no more doubts, we can finish the session. I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you so much, all of you, to, to stay this morning. And I hope that you can enjoy the rest of the weekend. Okay, this session was recorded, so... Uh, we will pl publish on, on YouTube if you want to, to see it again. One last question. Daniel, uh, you use six ounces elastics 24 hours a day, but the goal was not to procline the incisors. How did you manage not to procline? Well, with lower APR and some expansion. That's the way. But one thing is um, the goal that you have and the real result. I understand that with class two elastics, six ounces, I'm going to create some lower proclination, but the the way to control it is just check how is the the or how are the roots related to the bone, touching the roots of the patient. And if you see any problem, you will stop stop using elastics or place mini screws on the upper arch to avoid class two elastics. That's another option. But if you see that everything is going well, it's better to to reduce uh, mini screws use. And again, thank you so much to all of you and have a great weekend. See you soon. Bye-bye.